today we are honoring Tubashot. This is a minor Jewish holiday that celebrates the birthday of the trees, as we heard earlier in our message for all ages. So technically Tubashot is next week. Uh, it starts at sunset on the 20th and it ends at sunset on the 21st, however. Next week is another important holiday in the life of our country and of our religious tradition, so we're acknowledging Tu Bishat a week early today. I first encountered Tu Bishat while I was a student at Andover Newton Theological School. My alma mater has since moved, but when I was at school, we shared a campus with Hebrew College. We occasionally had the chance to take interfaith classes that were co-taught by professors from both campuses, or both schools. I was taking such a class on interfaith religious education one January when our colleagues from Hebrew College taught us about Tubashat. One of the rabbis in training explained that in Judaism, it is forbidden to eat the fruit of a tree before its fourth year or its seventh year, depending on who you ask. <laughs> but how do you know how old a tree is? Well, he said, give them a birthday. <laughs> we then participated in a very pared down version of the two shop seder. We did not have 15 fruits, but we did enjoy some of the traditional fruits shared at such a seder that includes pomegranate, figs, olives, and grapes. The fruits are a symbol of the abundance of the land of Israel and also a way of connecting Jews around the world to that land. We also had four cups of grape juice. <laughs> a, a traditional Seder would have wine, but it was 10 a.m. and not all of us drank, so we had grape juice. The first cup was white juice, and that symbolizes winter. The second cup was white mixed with red as a harbinger of spring. The third was red mixed with white as a symbol of early spring. And the fourth was red to symbolize spring and summer, the abundance thereof. Between each of these cups came a prayer, a story, a reflection, or a song. We learned and stumbled our way through some Hebrew. It was a really special time. And I was very touched by how essential conservation was to the faith of my Jewish colleagues. They spoke of the importance of being good stewards of God's creation. They talked about their personal Tubashat traditions, which included a fuller version of the Seder, planting trees, going for hikes in deeply forested areas. Our Tubashat Seder was fun, but it was also an earnest celebration of trees and the indispensable role that trees play in our lives. This experience has stayed with me over the years because it was fun and also because I really like the idea of a religious holiday to honor the birthday of trees. There are a lot of Jewish holidays and unfortunately as a congregation we haven't been able to acknowledge any of them this year except in prayer. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot all happened in September, which is the first month of our church here. And this year, it was the first month of our new shared ministry together, so we missed them. We will be celebrating Passover in a few months, but I didn't want to let another opportunity to celebrate our Jewish heritage go by. And when I say our Jewish heritage, I mean both the Jewish heritage of our congregants and also the Jewish heritage of Unitarian Universalism. I mentioned the sources of Unitarian Universalism very briefly last week, and it's fitting for us to consider this again this week because the illustration that is most commonly used to conceptualize our sources is a tree. If we think of Unitarian Universalism as a tree, our principles are our branches. This is what people can see, this is what bears fruit, but our principles would not exist without, and this is, these are branches, by the way. <laughs> this is what we do as religious educators. These are the branches, but our principles would not exist without our sources. These are the roots, branches, roots. We have six sources. They give us depth, and they give us channels through which we draw nourishment. We have seven principles, but without our six sources, we would have no depth and we would wither away. 
And we must remember that we have a shared history. From Judaism, a group broke away and became Christians. From Christianity, two groups broke away, became Unitarianism and Universalism. Later, the two joined up, obviously, as a very simplified version <laughs> of what happened. But my point is that we can trace our religious thought and our history very directly, very honestly, to Judaism. And for this reason, the fourth of our six sources is Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Judaism and Jewish teachings play explicit roles in what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. And for these reasons, all of these reasons, it is fitting for UU congregations to acknowledge and to honor Jewish holidays, including Tu B'Shaq. Several weeks ago, I sat down with Rabbi Jeff Falick from Birmingham Temple. We spent almost two hours together <laughs> at a local coffee shop. I got a ticket because my meter expired. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Uh, we were just so engrossed in conversation, I lost track of time. He was a great guy. We enjoyed getting to know each other and finding some of the places where we agree, a couple places where we don't agree. He's a lovely man, and I look forward to having a close working relationship with him and with Birmingham Temple. I asked him if he could join us today to teach us about Tubashat. Unfortunately, he was unavailable to join us today due to Jewish education commitments at the temple about Tubashat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought by doing it a week early, we might be able to get him, but no. He sends his regards, and I will keep working with him to find a time when it works for him to come and join us. When I told him that we were interested in celebrating Tubashat, he said, why? <laughs> <laughs> And I explained to him basically everything that I just explained to you about my, my personal experience with the holiday and how September went, and I wanted to find a way to celebrate Jewish heritage. And, and it turns out, shockingly, that there is more than one interpretation of Tubisha. <laughs> he told me that what I learned is common among a certain strand of young <coughs> liberal rabbis, which checks out. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Kaleik went on to explain that the more traditional understanding of Tubishat has to do with taxation, <coughs> which we heard a little bit about in Rabbi Gilman's uh, reflection that Don read for us earlier. So it's about taxation and tithing. That's the, the traditional understanding. But be that as it may, there were tithes due on fruit bearing trees in Israel. And for the new year, it's used to clarify which fruit is this year's versus last year's. So the rainy season in Israel starts in September, and four months later in January, trees start to bear fruit. And if fruit appears before the 15th day of Shvat, the month of Shvat, it is considered last year's, and therefore it is not included in this year's tithe calculations. I did a little research on my own and learned about who gets the tithe of the 10% of fruit. And there are several groups that get a percentage of that, but what struck me most was the provision to feed the poor. There are rules that dictate how much of the fruit goes to the poor every year. Plus, every seventh year, there is no tithe taken on the fruit and anyone is allowed to eat from the fruit of any tree. Now, these are ancient understandings, and I've read conflicting reports on whether this is still the case, but the tradition comes from Hebrew scripture. I'd like to share just a brief illustration with you. This is from a transliteration of the Torah, so it's direct transliteration from Hebrew, so it's not exactly a sentence structure, but word structure. Uh, this transliteration was done by Everett Fox. This is from the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verses 10 and 11. For six years you are allowed to sow your land and to gather in its produce, but in the seventh year you are to let it go and to let it be, that the needy of your people may eat and what they allow to remain, the wildlife of the field they eat. Mm -hmm. Thus do with your vineyard and with your olive grove. Jewish tradition and scripture have a keen interest in ensuring that the poor, those on the margins of society, are cared for. Even though a more traditional understanding of Tuvashat is about taxation, there are theological strains here that have resonance with our modern Unitarian Universalism. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves by caring for their physical needs. 
that level of care is evident in most Jewish scripture relating to agricultural practices. And I find it quite touching. There are three classically powerless groups mentioned throughout the Hebrew scripture. They are the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. Sometimes translated as the sojourner or the alien, depending. These three groups are found to be particularly vulnerable and therefore in need of special protection. In the ancient Hebrew world, being a member of one of these groups could put you at serious risk of starvation. And so agricultural practices have caveats for feeding people in these groups. Here's another passage from that transliteration by Everett Fox. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 20 through 21. When you knock off your olives, you are not to check the boughs after you, for the traveler, for the orphan, for the widow it shall be. When you cut off your grapes in your vineyard, you are not to glean after you, for the traveler, for the orphan, and for the widow it shall be. From these two passages, we can clearly see that Jewish laws governing harvest and taxation were constructed in a way that cares for the most vulnerable. The celebration of Tubishat provides a counting mechanism to mark that seventh year in which all people may eat the fruits of all trees, plus a collection of fruit for the poor in the other six years. This provision for the vulnerable is an illustration of how our fourth source, Jewish and Christian teaching, has inspired and fed into our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of all people. <laughs> the second theme of Tubishat that has made its way into Unitarian Universalism is our call to be good stewards of the earth, which is our seventh principle. I am joined in the leadership of today's service by members of our Great Sanctuary Ministry. The mission of the Green Sanctuary Ministry is twofold. First, they earned and they maintained a Green Sanctuary designation, or BUC. This means that our building and our habits meet a set of standards put forth by the Green Sanctuary Program of the Unitarian Universalist Association. We earned that designation in 2012, and BUC's Green Sanctuary Ministry helps us to ensure that we continue to meet those standards. The second area of focus for the Green Sanctuary Ministry is education and service opportunities for the congregation. Examples of their work in this area include participating in demonstrations in support of water rights for all, partnering with the Citizens Climate Lobby, and joining with other churches and organizations for political action in Lansing. And that's just an overview. They've done more than that and there's more to come. As you use, we value the earth as our home. We value the deep spiritual connection that all living things share. This is our seventh principle, and we call that the interdependent web of life. This reverence for the earth, this sense of responsibility to care for the earth as our home, is a reflection of the values celebrated in Tubashat as interpreted by my friends and colleagues at Hebrew College. Honoring the holidays of other traditions can give us a unique opportunity to explore our Unitarian Universalism. This can be all the more meaningful when we have shared roots with that other tradition, as is the case with Judaism. When we, as you use, honor a holiday, we bring our own unique perspective to the traditional interpretations. One of the wonderful things about being at UU is that we are invited, encouraged even, to have our own perspective on things. Perhaps for some of us, the theme of caring for the physical needs of the poor may be very moving. For others, the importance of environmental <coughs> stewardship may be particularly poignant. And there are still other interpretations, such as a mindfulness of the ways the trees have impacted our lives. Think of all the lessons that we can learn from trees. <coughs> trees bend so they don't break, which tells us something about spiritual flexibility. Trees also don't bear fruit unless their branches are toughened up by the wind, which tells us something about resilience. 
trees put down roots in the winter, giving us a beautiful analogy about the unseen growth that we experience in the coldest, darkest times of our lives. And there are so many other things that we can learn from trees. On this birthday of the trees, let us be mindful of those lessons. Let us seek them out. The Jewish heritage of Unitarian Universalism calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to remember the vast network of connections that join together all living things on this planet. And from that foundation, let us be motivated to action in the name of justice and good stewardship of the earth. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.